Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard. You're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. I'm also the author of Visualizing Happiness in Every Area of Your Life. So if you want a step-by-step guide to creating an incredible life of your own, please pick up a copy of my book. Today, my guests are Dr. Elsbeth Moit and Freddie Zentel Weaver. So Dr. Elsbeth Moit and Freddie Zentel Weaver, a longtime couple in life and work, come from dramatically different backgrounds. She, a German immigrant to the US who was a top management consultant for many years and in her adult years, consciously moving away from a sexually repressive childhood. He, an American, I'm sorry, an African-American man, son of a highly regarded psychiatrist and pioneer of creative self-discovery who grew up in San Francisco, the nexus of sexual revolution. When they both met after connecting on a tantric dating website, it did indeed seem destined. The East Indian teachings of Tantra, most often associated with sexual pleasure, are more completely about mastering one's energy for full embodiment of life. The couple realized that they could help others to find a tantric path to joy through workshops, coaching, speaking engagements, and other programs. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great Great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And you both look lovely and glowing. And (laughs) we all want to look lovely and glowing. And I know a lot of it's coming from inside. So really excited to get into this. But um, just so people can get to know you, um, I'll start with you, Dr. Elsbeth. Um, Tell us about your life, how you started out and you know how you met freddie oh yes i love to share uh, how i came to this present moment (laughs) being with you and uh, having been with my beloved Um, so as you already mentioned in the opening i am uh, i grew up in germany and i came in my late 20s to the united states to do postgraduate work in music Um, And then uh, shortly after I got my doctorate in education and then I moved into management consulting. So, and I'm sharing this because I was not always a Tantra teacher, you know, and there was a real turn in my life, which happened around when I hit 50. And what I hit at that moment as well uh, was that I felt very despaired about relationship. Now I had gotten very good in my consulting work. I traveled the world, yet I had this pattern of attracting unavailable men. And while that was exciting, most of the time I was alone. And as I said, there came a point when I became keenly aware of the trajectory if I were not going to change that pattern of being drawn to unavailability that I would end up without lasting intimacy and love in my life before I leave this planet and I just did not want to settle for that so that uh, also in my despair just said anything whatever I need to do to see what was in the way of me to create lasting intimacy and love and bring in a beloved because I did have intimacy and love, but I was not able to sustain it. So there was something in the way like a veil, you know, in front of our eyes, but I didn't know what that veil was. So that is when I delved deeply into the practice of Tantra. I was familiar with the practice, but had never studied it seriously as a discipline and through the practice of tantra and the tantric healing what i discovered was that i had held distress towards men now if you had known me dr kimberly you would not have called me a distrusting bitch you know not at all i was charming i reeled them in i was inviting but there was something underneath that was not obvious to the mere eye or to the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. That was actually that distrusting. No wonder that I attracted unavailability. Not that I wanted this for my conscious mind, 
but in the subconscious there was something. And that was revealed to me through the tantric practice that is really an all encompassing practice of the body, of the sexual self, of the emotional, the love self, the mental, the spiritual self. And um, that could get all cleared uh, through the healing so that, you know, six months later when Freddie came into my life, I could recognize him, which I think I would not have if I hadn't done the clearing work because he was available and that didn't fit with the previous pattern. Beautiful. <coughs> Beautiful. So, um, Betty, do you want to share your your story up until then? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, great, Dr. Kimberly. Thanks for having us on. Um, yeah, Elsb and I have been together for 21 years, running and doing this work all over the world, working with singles and couples and you know, teaching them these practices. So a lot of what we teach in our curriculum, I was first introduced to <clears throat> when I was 13 years old. I was living in Hawaii. Uh, you know, I was raised in San Francisco and Hawaii, uh, and my father at the time was a practicing psychiatrist, and I at 13 was going through my puberty and spending a lot of time in the shower. Uh, so my father took pity on me and gave me a book to read, but I thought I was going to hurt myself in there, on how to integrate meditation and sex practices. Mm -hmm. Very lucky to have him in my life. Anyway, I loved it. My girlfriend loved it. And even more importantly, at the time, I was working to become uh, an athlete in college on athletic scholarship, which was my dream to do that. But I had doubts about my capacity to do that. Well, the practices of sexual meditation allowed me to get past my belief to really move into creating that so. So I went on to college uh, on athletic scholarship. And at the end of college, I, after college, I continued to do these practices and apply these principles in my relationships and in my life. Uh, I was in the software business for a long time in San Francisco. Uh, and what I knew about my own inspiration that was missing after 10 years in that business, and I was looking to be inspired, reinvigorated again in my life. So there was an opportunity in Chicago. The company hired me, moved me here. That was 21 years ago. And I really came here to meet Elsbeth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, I was single, and so I was online looking for Shakti, a female tantra partner. And Elsbeth was online, and we met, and it was kismet to the moment, six months to the day we met, we transcended what I call the romantic drama and created this Tantra Nova work. She had already had the beginnings of it. And then I came in and bought my little piece to it. And we, we really meshed together, pooled our resources and created something that really has fulfilled me personally in terms of my gifts and what I can offer in the world uh, and Elspeth and us collectively as well. And we're excited to be here tonight to share some of these practices and at least get people uh, introduced to, to, to those who haven't uh, been introduced before to this, this way of really transforming how we're creating our life, what's possible. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get to that and very few entail how to work consciously with life force or sexual energy. So we wanna unpack a little bit of that with you tonight. Yes, and I, I would love to, to hear about that because I think when people hear of ta you know that tantric practices um, different people have different ideas. Is it some weird religious thing? Is it, is it some weird practice or is it, you know, what is this, you know, or why should I actually be concentrating on this? There, there's so many things that come up because people just don't know what it is. So why don't you give us a basic one, two, three, what, what is it? Yes. Wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about Tantra and what Tantra is, where it comes from. So Tantra is the yoga of the energetic body, unlike most forms of yoga that we are familiar with here in the West. You know, there's a yoga studio at every street corner in the big cities, um, which has become very popular over the last 30 years in the West. Um, so most forms of yoga we are familiar, familiar with are uh, the yoga of the physical body. Hatha yoga. Yeah, so we stretch, we take our positions, all of this. Tantra yoga is the yoga of the energetic body, where we learn to listen to our energies, to the frequencies that run through us at all times, otherwise we wouldn't be alive. But just like blood flow that we are not aware of, but it's running all the time, 
energy runs through the human being at all times. And sexual energy that is life force that has brought us into this life without it, we wouldn't be speaking here. Um, that energy we wanna, that life force energy, we wanna explore further. Because once I can listen and sense that energy, I can actually affect that energy. So life force energy comes into us at the moment of conception and leaves us when we leave this planet. And we call it actually life force sexual energy because there is no difference between life force energy and sexual energy. It's the same energy. So just like right now, most of us are probably in a subtle state of energy. I'm speaking, you are listening, everyone else here who is listening to the podcast. At least I assume, you know, you are not aroused. Speak for yourself. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then when I walk by Lake Michigan, we, we are headquartered in Chicago. So when I walk by Lake Michigan, then I can feel, you know, the breeze touching my skin. And that may feel very pleasant. So there's just a heightened arousal, not a high arousal, but a pleasant arousal. And then, of course, all the way up to a climax, be it an ejaculation uh, for the man or a climax for the woman, which is very high arousal. So that energy is the same just at different gradations that we experience differently. So we can actually learn how to be with that energy and play it like a flute, like the different registers, mm -hmm. you know? So it really embellishing, uh, embellishes our experience. And then I wanna uh, build a little further on it. What is then also unique about it is in the practice is that we integrate our sexual physical being with our heart and love being and with our spiritual being so the spiritual and the sexual actually become reintegrated because that is something that often got compartmentalized you know like they don't belong together and one is bad one is good no we are both earthly and heavenly beings, mm -hmm. and we are just as much sexual as we are spiritual. But how would it be to learn to actually have our spiritual being communicate with our sexual being? And our sexual being fuel our spiritual being, fuel our love being the heart. So that is what's available. And of course, in that process, we return to greater wholeness. And of course, only when we feel whole, we can feel fulfilled. And that is how we can share ourselves more fully with another. So I don't come to another to because I, I need something. No, I come to the other because I want to share something. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. And um, I, I just have to tell you a funny experience I had so many many years ago I had a best friend a male best friend and um he really wanted to learn this tantra so he got this book and he said okay we have to do this where you feeling the energy going from the bottom to the top and you just have to circle it I'm like okay well I don't know so we're <laughs> and we are fully clothed actually we're just sitting next to each other like facing each other fully clothed. And then we're trying to run this energy. And I'm like, I don't know, is he feeling, are you feeling, I don't know. I don't know. If I'm, <laughs> but I think a lot of times people do approach things that way. It's like, okay, I know what I'm supposed to feel, but how do I even start or initiate or get that flow going? Because we were, um, you know, we mutually loved each other and we respected each other and we wanted to share that. But Somehow it's like, like, I don't know, getting on a, a, a merry-go-round and we can't get it to move around the circle. Yes, good. This is good, Dr. Kimberly, because this is getting to the core of what this work is. 
So, you know, people have heard probably the, the article where Sting said, oh, he makes love to his wife for eight hours, you know, at a time. And a lot of guys come to our work and that's what they're interested in or that's what they know about Tantra. Now we're Tantra new, so we're integrating some of the, again, energetic yoga of the East and the West uh, in terms of transformation and how that can tap us into a deeper listening energetically, emotionally, and, and uh, so on. Uh, and then also the approaches in the West in terms of psychology, how we you know, develop ourselves uh, and create a reality and language and discover ourselves in the creative discovery process through music and movement and art. And then what's interesting is working consciously with life forces, sexual energy, which is unique for people, because if you think of it, this energy was, you know, creating life before we had language. And there is an intelligence when we bring consciousness to it, that, ele that element of creativity and pleasure start to show up in areas of your life when you bring consciousness to the sexual that seem completely unrelated to sex because your listening has become more acute. So the idea of what you guys started to do in terms of tapping into this energetic microcosmic orbit that you were wanting to do, which sounds like something from Montauk Chia, mm -hmm. uh, which is very possible. So what we teach initially for people is how to uh, begin to get out of what we live in, which is the stories in our mind, the conversation, the internal conversation. And there are particular practices with the breath awareness that we teach and, um, and muscle awareness and these are the beginnings of learning to work consciously with what happens in that altered state of the sexual experience uh, as, as well. Now, once you learn some of these practices, you can apply them and they will become uh, informative in terms of your mutual lovemaking. But there's a particular ritual that we teach that creates um, an opportunity for people to be in their sexual energy unencumbered, if you will, with the give and take of the usual sexual experience with another. So if you have someone giving to you in this ritual practice that we teach, they are the giver. So they don't uh, engage with you with, if they have sexual uh, uh, awakening or aliveness. They're managing their own sexual energy and holding space for you to have whatever shows up in what happens in this uh, uh, shift that happens sexually. In terms of the um, chemicals we shift, more endorphins, serotonin, oxytocin, the feel-good hormones. Emotionally, we're more open, vulnerable, and receptive. So that's the state in the sexual piece. Now, with the distinctions of energetic awareness, um, uh, with intention that you want to create an intention to see something, like I want to create a beloved or work that's fulfilling or a place that's inspiring, what happens in that unmasked, altered state, we get more receptive to what we don't see that's running in the background. So we can get in touch with something at a deeper level in that altered state. And that's how we're working consciously with sexual energy for people to be able, begin to transform and move with grace, ease, and flow towards what they want to create. That's just kind of a yeah. touch of how this let, starts. Mm -hmm. Let me just give an example, you know, how that for my own life, and I go a little deeper in that, uh, you know, what I discovered in my tantric healing, because that is such a great example for what Freddie alluded to in terms of the unmasking and that revealing when we are consciously in that flow of our sexual self that may be so laden with shame, fear, guilt, embarrassment, you know, these are collective emotions. These are not individual emotions. We all have them. Um, and so the unmasking, that was actually really what opened up for me to tap into a realm that I could not tap into through talk therapy. So here's what happened in my tantric healing. And I went solo because I was single at the time. And I wanted to find out what was in the way of, for me to bring in the beloved and sustain love and intimacy. Um, so I worked with a practice partner in our workshops. People can come single as well, just as couples come who work together. Mm -hmm. um, and as a single, you then pair up with the practice partner. And um, these rituals are not about having sex or lovemaking. These rituals are there, as Freddie described, that there's a giver and a receiver. And in my ritual, I was the receiver. And I was very honored by this man 
who I met at this workshop for the first time, but both of us had come to do our own work. So there was commitment, seriousness, and all of that available. And um, so when I was touched inside my sexual center, which is called Yoni, Y-O-N-I, Yoni in Sanskrit means sacred space. Imagine if you and I and all the women who are listening right now, if we had been introduced to our sexual center as a sacred space, how differently our sexual trajectory may have gone, you know, instead of don't go there, you know, mm -hmm. wait until you're married and it's a bad thing, it's sinful, or, you know, mm -hmm. no, it's the most sacred space. So when I was touched in my uni inside around 11 o'clock, a vivid memory came up from the time when I was 18 years old, first love, first boyfriend, we had a very blissful relationship. And then he asked me to have intercourse. And I said, yes, although I was not ready. And it was freakingly painful. I had to go to the gynecologist, then the bill went to my house. My dad opened it. All hell broke loose. He called me a whore. The boyfriend left a few weeks later. So there I was all alone, no soul to turn to. And at that moment, I made a decision, which was something like, see, Elspeth, men are never there for you when you need them. And that decision trailed throughout my ad young adult life into my older adult life. Now, I did some therapy around this experience, and, which was very useful, very helpful. And so I thought it was all complete. However, what I didn't know was that there was memory on the cellular level. We all hold memory on the cellular level all over the body as well as in the yoni, that I was holding memory there that was not accessible through my conscious mind. So I couldn't talk about it. However, through that healing practice, it was accessed through the touch, through that place I was in of receiving, of letting go, of opening up, this unmasking, you know. Like the ultimate somatic work. Mm -hmm. And that is when, you know, of course, all that pain, that physical pain, that emotional pain uh, from the 18 <clears throat> year old came back. And it was like opening a valve, you know, it gets more intense and then it fizzles out in the same way these feelings got more intense and then they fizzled out. And in place of all of that, what opened up was deeper trust in myself and then deeper trust in men in general. And then, as I said earlier, in six, within six months, Freddie came into my life, you know? Mm -hmm. That is what we mean, that we can clear really old wounds, uh, things that may be obscured, that may not be at the surface. Yeah, this is a great example of what opens up for people. Again, we've been doing this work all over the world with couples and singles uh, who are, you know, introduced and in brand uh, some brand new to, you know, meditation and sex, sex, sexual sexual uh, awakening practices. You know, in terms of that, we are creating what we're getting, but it often looks like there's something that's out there that's going to show up somehow, maybe, and it does here and there, but somehow it doesn't work out. But we have this desire in terms of what we might most deeply want. So it's really getting to what we don't see about how we're creating what we're getting. And, you know, you can get actionable insights from therapeutic, you know, conversation, yet energetically, and what we're talking about is shifting something at an energetic level. Uh, you know, in terms of how something shows up for us that we don't even see that shows up. It's a frequency. It's an old experience. It's not even, it doesn't look like what it looked like when it happened, you know, uh, when, when our heart was broken in high school or when we got spanked in potty training or when something happened somewhere along our life that we made a decision that still somehow impacts how we live our interpretations and the decisions that we live by. But yet what, what really is the good news is that we are part of this elegant design of the universe that goes on forever 
And the way that shows up for us is in our imagination, our capacity to imagine something that's never been before in our life. So working with this clay that we are, this memory and neurosynaptic experiential uh, stuff, these practices uh, are very uh, vital to shifting something. Because again, what happens in the sexual, there's an intelligence there, that, that uh, organic shift uh, chemically and emotionally. And when you bring consciousness again with an awareness of your breath and what we call the witness state of mind, the observer, where you really get that we are more than our thoughts, then we can start to step a little bit away and begin to move beyond the clay that we are to create a new story and a new experience and a new interpretation and a new belief. Beautiful. And um, so I'm thinking about that. Um, so if we're there for another person or they're there for us, how do we stay within ourselves, within our own power or authentic who we are and yet open up and create space for the other person and create that intimacy. Do you know what I'm asking? Yes. So <clears throat> it really, it needs to be set up and both need to come with the same commitment. They're very clear agreements in these rituals. And of course we don't go right away to these rituals um, because we don't go to sexual aroused energy right away. If we were to do that, not much would change mm -hmm. because no awareness would have shifted. So it may be actually good just for a moment to do a little practice if, if we may. Yes, that would be great. I was gonna ask if there's some little thing we can start with. <laughs> Yes, because that may lead us into how I want to bring myself then to another. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the breath is the key because energy cannot flow without the breath. It's, you know, uh, the, the last thing that goes when a person dies is the breath. And once the breath is gone, life force energy is gone. So if they go together in dying, they must go together in living mm -hmm. so uh so i'm just going to guide a little practice that everyone who is listening if you want to drop into this you want to sit with an erect spine because then your energy that runs along the spine up to the top of the head and back down again can move more easily through you and then place your right hand on your belly around the navel area and when you are ready, close your eyes and exhale all air. Then taking in a deep breath in through the nose, following it down into the lungs, further down into the diaphragm, into the belly. And on the exhalation, following the breath, moving up and out of your nostrils. Again, a deep breath in through the nose down into the lungs, all the way down into the belly, extend the belly into the end. And on the exhalation, following the breath, moving up and out of your nostrils. Continue in this pattern. And if any thought comes up, just let the thought be, notice it. And on the next exhalation, let the thought go. Following the breath, coming in, moving down into the belly on the inhale, and following the breath up and out on the exhale. Beautiful. And then take your hand just one inch off. Continue breathing in this pattern. Deep breath in through the nose, all the way down into the belly, extending the belly into the hand, although you are no longer touching. And on the exhalation, following the breath, back up and out of the nostrils. And then remove your hand. 
watching your breath coming and going, the belly rising on the inhale, and the belly falling on the exhale. And then take a moment and notice how you're feeling right now, how your body is feeling. Notice your emotional state. And notice your state of mind, your state of thought. Then you could come back by opening your eyes. And Dr. Kimberly, if you would be so kind and share how you may be feeling right now. Fuller. More um, aware and uh, I feel in a bit much bigger space. Yeah. Beautiful. Or expanded. Beautiful. Do you feel more present? Yes. And do you feel more relaxed? Yes. <laughs> what about your mind? May your mind be less chattering? Yes, it is less chattering. So this is what we want to cultivate to be in our own flow, where we become more present to ourselves and the breath is the best access to ourselves. Also, of course, when we breathe more deeply, we get more oxygenated, we do the parasympathetic or diaphragmatic breath that really requires awareness, you know, not automatic breath like in the chest. Mm -hmm. So that is, from that place, you know, from that posture, I want to bring myself to my partner when I'm the giver. Being present, mm -hmm. it's not about my gratification, it's not about my agenda. I leave that outside the room. When I give to the receiver, I'm fully there to serve him or for, could be also to women in same-sex couples or to men. Um, so, because when I'm fully present, when I'm not there to get something, he can start relaxing because I don't want anything from him. There is a great freedom in that. Mm -hmm. And actually it opens up intimacy because he can trust that I'm there for him. Mm -hmm. that I support him in like channel his energy from the sexual center up into his heart center. Mm -hmm. He learns these different registers, you know, that we spoke about earlier. And this is really, this is remembering what we've forgotten, these practices, you know, because when we were in the womb, this is the way it was. It was womb service and we were floating, <laughs> and, you know, embryonic <laughs> fluid. There was no worry about anything, food or getting growth, nothing. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. We're born, these bright lights whacked on the bottom. Some guys are getting their wee wees cut, you know, and you're thinking, send me back. And then life happens, potty training and everything else that happens. And then we grow up and we have been, you know, had all these experiences, but we have this these moments of really blissfulness and we fall in love and and then other stuff comes up and we fight. And, and that looks like uh, the reason I'm upset is because of something outside where external internally referenced. So these practices return us to, a confidence that we can actually find that peace at any moment. And it's in that peace, in that space of peace that we can start to move towards what we most deeply desire. If it's something that appears in our story that it's not possible. And then it's like th creating something with a thought alone, which being, you know, a thought alone, you know, it was a quieting all of the frequency disconnect stuff that happens and seeing that that's okay over there. And then slowly we, what I call flatten this stuff. And it just is like a blip over there and we can keep moving towards mm -hmm. what we most deeply desire. And that's how this works. So the sexual piece becomes a real uh, ally in creating an altered state of awareness and it's available to anyone. Mm -hmm. And of course, a great deal of healing is available just, you know, as you could tell from my story, 
and a great deal of freedom and opening and you know pleasure may arise like many people when they come back from that homework practice of we both teach uh, sexual meditation practice solo and then this partner practice that we alluded to more um, when they come back that they often say i did not know that i even could do that or like women come back after a you know, a ritual with their partner or with their practice partner that they say they connected with themselves or they felt intimately connected in a way they never had felt before or that some, you know, something lifted around their sexual self or their trauma or intimacy so that they could become more self-expressed you know more into their fullest uh, and of course it you know it's this is why we say it's for both singles and couples because on one hand all of us need to do our own work mm -hmm. because when i'm with freddie i bring myself to the relationship and if i am compartmentalized in myself and if I'm unhappy or if I am not in my fullest freedom how can I expect from him you know to bring himself in his fullest so we want to do our own work and of course as a couple we can do our work together so it, it goes hand in hand and um, it can be very blissful yeah and I was thinking, you know, even as you were speaking about um, just being present yourself, it would be great interacting with anyone, your children or other people, even in the workplace. If you were walking around, uh, uh, reminds me of the um, one technique I learned where you pretend that your head is floating. <laughs> but if you're going around the workplace in your happy bubble of breathing and energy moving so few so few things would bother you as much as if you were You're, you've got the idea i mean really owning our upsets is internally referenced because if we look externally we give up our power and this is where most of us live we have a story about the way someone looked at us or we've got a story or opinion about something and that creates the feeling that we have so if we can just begin to own whatever upset is there and begin to have a little bit of a space from this, you know, busy cha-cha mind that we live in, and it's not going to stop, but we can learn to watch the story without what we call the total felt sense of the story, the emotional, energetic experience that happens from the thought. And this is becomes, again, people come to it and they think, oh, I'm going to have better orgasms or better sex. And yes, you will be informed there. And it's bigger than the bedroom once you get into it. As I said, once you start to this kind of listening and shifts, it happens everywhere. It's wherever you go. It's like George Carlin said, wherever you go, there you are. Yes, <laughs> that is that is just so true. So I would love to keep talking, but we're getting close to the end here. So I would like for you to share what services you have and how do people contact you and also about your, uh, we haven't even talked about your audio book. Yes, yes. Now the audio book is goes, of course, further into depth of what we opened up here today. So yeah, our uh, audio book that was released um, a few months ago uh, is now available and it's called Sexual Enlightenment. How to create lasting fulfillment in life, love and intimacy. And that's available on Amazon or any other uh, outlet where audiobooks are available. And then another way of contacting us and learning more is through our website, tantranova.com, spelled T A N T R A N O V A.com. Tantra Nova, like Supernova, mm -hmm. the new Tantra. And actually there on the homepage, you can scroll down and there 
is the book and click on the Amazon link and leads you right there. And also in our program section, there are so many offerings. I teach a women's workshop for women only. I call it Awaken to Your Feminine Essence. It has very much to do for us women to come into balance of our feminine and masculine or yin and yang so that we can feel, you know, whole and fully expressed and be connected with our beautiful heart and our beautiful yoni because often the two of them may have gotten disconnected when growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and then Freddie teaches an all men's workshop, which is called Men, Sex and Power, mm -hmm. where a man can learn how to separate ejaculation mm -hmm. from orgasm, which are not, which this is not the same. So that, and what can lead a man to really have experienced multiple orgasms, orgasmic waves, stay present to himself, connects, uh, when he connects his sex with his heart, and of course, then he becomes also much more available and present to his partner. And these practices are for anyone, be they heterosexual, homosexual, transgender, bisexual, uh, because we all are this energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in relationship, there's always polarity. One is more in their yin and the other one is more in their yang. If that polarity is not present, there's no magnetism. You know, sometimes couples wonder why the juice went out. Mm -hmm. You know, they have become so similar. Um, and they are both in their masculine like this or both in their feminine like that. And I'm using this not in gender terms, feminine and masculine, mm -hmm. using it uh, as characteristics, as textures. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then of course, there's our YouTube channel, uh, Tantra Nova. Um, so plenty of opportunities. And if someone wants to really see how that all may apply to their own life in a very personal way, either solo life or coupled life, um, you are invited to schedule a complimentary consult with us where we can explore that and where we can listen and support you. Beautiful. And I had another um, question that just came up. Um, so, you know, when you're in love, especially when it's new, you just want to be together. But in the last few years, we had something called COVID or pandemic or whatever. And all of a sudden, couples who usually went to work or stayed home, they weren't seeing each other during the day, but then they'd come back. Of course, they're happy seeing each other at the end of the day, but so much togetherness. What's a healthy togetherness and separateness? How much separate, like being apart, do we need so we can come back and be ready to unite again. It's an individual thing, Dr. Kimberly, as you know, it's up to what you feel. So if you're connected energetically and you're listening to what feels uh, right for you, then you can see what you need. Uh, you know, either you take that walk or you go and you do, we do meditation often in the morning together, which kind of sets our day. We talk about how that went. Then we, we do do a separate days. You know, we're out. And we, then we come together on things. But there's little things that we can do that it just in passing that can create connection. Uh, and it's that sense of getting out of being irritated by the other. Again, that external reference. So that internal listening should be developed. And if you can see the relationship as an opportunity to see something about yourself that you otherwise wouldn't see, then the relationship becomes a way to keep becoming stronger and more continually grounded in your, your own listening. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Yes, that's helpful, yes. yes. So, so also like, you know, we live together, we mm. work together, we are beloveds. So we spend quite a bit of time together. Yeah, so 21 years is really 42 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it's very essential that both partners have their own purpose. Now we have a joint purpose, but within that joint purpose, 
you know, we have different roles. We also have different hobbies. Freddie loves to uh, motorcycle. And um, I love to go to Lake Michigan for working out and walks. And so there are very unique moments where we do our own personal stuff. But then really the question of like, who is creating the quality of the relationship? It is me. It is him. We are doing it together. So the whole question about relationship becomes then a co-creation versus I'm turning to someone because I need something. And they are doing it or supplying it, whatever that Or not be. in the way. That is where the conflict, the dissatisfaction arise. So we want to come to the relationship as co-creators. And we can co-create on all levels, on the physical, sexual, not only within, but also with each other on the heart, love level, on the mental, you know, intuitive level, on the spiritual level. And yes, you wanna have practices both by yourself and with each other. We connect every day. We call them tantric quickies. Mm -hmm. They are one minute long, two minute long. They are not sexual practices, but they connect us like heart to heart mm -hmm. where we touch each other's heart. And mm -hmm. I know on the podcast, you won't see this, but here you can see it on the video. We place one hand on the other's heart center. Mm -hmm. And then we breathe in together. Mm -hmm. We put our minds focus on receiving energy from the hand at our heart on the inhalation, attention on the sensation and intention to move it in the direction that we're wanting to with our using our minds. So not just waiting for something, we're using our sensate focus. And then on the exhalation, visualize sending into the other's heart on the exhalation. Mm. And we use the left eye, left eye gaze. So it's sending mm -hmm. on the exhalation and receiving on the inhalation. So now we have a circuit. Mm. And the eye gaze is really <laughs> to be present to each other, not looking for deep meaning. Oh, is he loving me? Yes, of course he loves me. It's just letting go of the story and conversation, dropping into the nothingness of just being. Mm -hmm. And then, then what's there is love, it's, it's connection. That's what shows up when we get out of our heads. Yeah. And Dr. Kimberly, we have an agreement that when one of us comes to the other, that we go into the practice. Now, not necessarily when I'm in the middle of a phone call or so, Freddie comes over, but I may be in the middle of a project working on my computer. And when he comes over to me and I drop everything for a minute or two, we breathe together, we connect, and it's like a recalibration, you know? And I emerge more rejuvenated. He goes off and does his thing. And there was this sweet connection, mm -hmm. you know? Love making doesn't start in the bedroom. It's the every moment of the day in these little connections paying attention, being present, breathing with each other, because the breath really allows us in the synchronized way to feel being one. Mm -hmm. It just happens. Also, the beautiful thing is breathing together. We drop out of the busy mind, the judging mind, into the loving heart. And that's really the secret of you know, cultivating sustained intimacy and love. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for being on the podcast and sharing. And, you know, you've given us a place to start. And, you know, I, I can see, like I said, when you came on, I can see that, that inner glow that you have. And I, I see that, that joy that, you know, most people want that joy and it's so nice to have it for yourself. But then if you can have it with a partner, even better. Why not? <laughs> yes. So, yeah. And just like, as you could tell with me, that was not always the case. But with intentionality, we can bring it into our, our life and we want to get the right support, the right guidance. I, I really needed guidance 
to take off the veil and my, you know, my, the illusion about love so that I could drop into love and create love as a practice daily now with my beloved. Yeah. So one last question and either of you or both of you can answer it. What is your best advice on living an incredible, amazing life? Well, one, to enjoy your life. Uh, two, um, own your upsets. Start looking at and own your life. So anything that's in your life that you have a constant complaint about, keep looking at it because if it's, if it's constantly there, either choose it or lose it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. My advice is really just building on that heart connection to also do this with myself, to regularly during the day drop into my heart. Sometimes mm. I place my hand on my chest just to connect here, breathe into my heart, connect to my love self that immediately, you know, allows me to let go of worries, of anxiousness, or you know, whatever may be there. And the heart is a really good friend and knows what we want. So it's also a good way to consult my heart if I need to make a decision. So connect with your heart. And when you connect with your heart, place your hand on your heart and breathe into your heart and listen. Wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Thank you too, Dr. Kimberly. Thanks, Dr. Kimberly, for having us on your platform. Yes, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Look forward to it. Mm -hmm.